A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor and privilege to be here this afternoon. Uh, you now have your lunch. I hope what I say doesn't actually cause you uh, to uh, have problems with that lunch now that you've actually got into the process of digesting it. So uh, let's hope uh, I can keep your interest uh, in that first, obviously, of the post-lunch sessions. Well, uh, we've heard from a number of senior speakers um, already today how we face a difficult and determined enemy. The seriousness of the challenge, of course, cannot be overstated. But with the United States undoubtedly taking the brunt of the challenge, uh, pr 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 protecting our shared values is undoubtedly an international effort. It is, of course, our service personnel who daily face danger on our behalf. Uh, but we in the science, engineering, and technology community have a duty to support them. And that's an international effort, too. So once again, it's a great privilege and honor to be here and to talk to you this afternoon. Now, one thing I realize is I assume to get my chart, so I just ask for the next chart. Is that right? Okay, I guess that's what happens. Good. Okay. Well, you see here basically uh, what it is that I'm hoping to talk to. Just say a little bit about uh, context, uh, about why it is that uh, we're actually interested in science and technology. A few examples, and then I want to move on to the subject of uh, innovation, which I think is a, a critical aspect underpinning all aspects of uh, what we seek to do. So, next chart, please. Now, I'm going to start with a few possibly provocative, but hopefully not in this audience, propositions. Uh, a few things that might seem, really, to this sort of audience is just straightforward common sense, but strangely, we find uh, we have difficulties in getting these points across to some audiences. So, my first proposition, the only difference between the old equipment and the new is science and technology. There is no other difference. Otherwise, you'd just be making the same stuff that you had before. That seems pretty fundamental and perhaps puts the, the role of science and technology uh, fairly and squarely uh, in the place that it should be. Next chart, please. My second proposition. Whilst replacing old equipment with new gives incremental advantage, the world's best sword is no match for the smart munition. Now, I'm not saying that incremental isn't important. Absolutely, in many cases, incremental and spiral acquisition is exactly the right way to do things. But it's important to understand it doesn't solve all of our needs, uh, nor does it create all of our opportunities. And if we want to look to opportunities, we have to look beyond, in many cases, the benefits that uh, incremental acquisition uh, certainly brings. Next chart, please. My third proposition, <clears throat> equipment advantage based on science and technology only buys you time. That's all, nothing else, just time. An agile, determined, and capable enemy will close that gap. Now, the chart you see there, the graph you see there, is one that I presented to you two years ago at the previous conference. And without going into details, it simply says that uh, if you look at how equipment quality compares amongst a number of nations, the factor that differentiates is entirely due to research and development investment in real dollars. So that's the point very uh, closely, we believe, uh, brought home by our analysis. Research and development is what shapes the quality of your equipment and all that you get from science and technology investment is time. Time, therefore, is precious. Time is the thing you have to capitalize on in trying to defeat your enemy. Okay, next chart, please. And this is a build-up. Uh, just, just hold on before building up, please. Let me explain it. Uh, you see here a very simple kind of plot, which is going to be something like a, a bit of a Boston plot, a kind of portfolio analysis presentation. And on the ordinate, on the left-hand side, we have technology leap. Uh, ranging from small at the bottom to large at the top. And along the abscissa, along the x-axis, we have time uh, to insertion and utilize, with short again on the left-hand side and long on the right. So can we build now? Next chart, please. Next part. First of all, we have in the top right-hand corner where we'd all really like to be. This is the game change. Well, where we feel we would like to be. Uh, it's the game-changing thing. It's that stuff which we know will be challenging, but it's going to give us a real big techno technological advantage. Next, please. Of course, this is the holy grail. Wouldn't this be great? Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could actually achieve those major technological leaps, but in a short time scale? That's the thing we want, and perhaps that's what we mean when we talk about disruptive. Next, please. Okay, agility. This is where we need to be fast. This is, yes, talking about perhaps small technological advances, but if we're going to capitalize them, 
on them. If we're going to achieve that uh, advantage I talked about as a time difference, we've got to be quick. So this is where we need to understand most vividly the importance of taking small, uh, perhaps very significant science and technology leaps and applying them quickly. And as General Wallace pointed out earlier today, the key thing is here we have a very quick enemy, an enemy that's adapting and learning very quickly. So we've got to be quick too. So another reason why this is an important place to work, but work fast. Next, please. And, of course, this is where our enemy wants us to be. And uh, far be it from me to be cynical, but you might say that's possibly where a lot of our systems try and push us to be, uh, that actually trying to uh, achieve uh, innovation somehow gets caught up in a variety of bureaucratic and other forms of processes. But whatever happens, this is the place we absolutely have to move from. And when I talk in terms of taking the, the battle to the enemy, I'm talking about that science and technology component. And what I'm saying is, whatever we do, we have to move from that bottom right-hand quadrant to move in the directions of the other three and be very careful about the seductive powers that tend to draw us towards that uh, long-term uh, action to get perhaps a small uh, benefit from our science and technology. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, same, same basic plot again, but uh, next, please. Um, I've dotted down here the seven components that we're talking about in this conference. Now, we could talk forever about whether I've got them in the right place, and I'm sure in many cases I haven't, but I'm really trying to point out a couple of things, I suppose. Uh, first of all, all these areas lie comfortably away from the danger zone, the bottom right-hand corner. That's the good news. Also, a number of them actually do span a wide area. They don't just sit in the particular area of the quadrant that I put them. So, for example, if we look at things like uh, immersive technology, of course, it's things that are giving us benefit today, but potentially could be incredibly uh, game-changing, if not disruptive, with certain innovations coming forward. The same must be true very much of network sciences. And when I look at things like neuroscience and biotechnology, you see I've got them a little bit low on the vertical axis. Well, that's not because I don't think they have the potential. Maybe there, are, there will be other factors that will affect us, things that will actually, uh, perhaps social acceptance, uh, some of the other difficult factors that might have an impact on how the public and, in general, uh, the uh, wider community will accept the in, in introduction of technologies based in this area. But as I say, the key message is all about moving things from that bottom right-hand corner and moving them into the other areas. And yes, if we can move things into the top left, that's really a good thing to do. But again, I think has already been pointed out, we can't plan and we can't direct very easily things to move into that top left-hand corner. Uh, very often, it's the unexpected uh, uh, innovation, that unexpected discovery. It's that that causes the jump because things rarely move slowly into the top left-hand corner. They leap in there. And that's why we always have to be vigilant about possibilities. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, here, here we have a, a general uh, cartoon showing what might be a futuristic uh, armored fighting vehicle. Next, please. And what I do around here is I just point to um, where we might see those technologies uh, appearing in this particular system. My point being that the technologies are indeed crucial in that they fit and impact in a number of areas, but it's ultimately how they impact upon the military capability seen through systems that is really important to us. So, for example, uh, we can start looking at uh, immersive technology, as I've already mentioned, uh, something which is help, helping today in training, uh, mission rehearsal, and also helps us more broadly in the context of the uh, soldier we see in this vehicle, uh, perhaps with elements of situational awareness. Quantum information science, how that could potentially revolutionize all the signal processing we do everywhere within any system. And we're very much into, of course, information. And how you turn data into information is very much about signal processing. So obviously a major uh, potential contributor there. I've added, if you'll forgive me, energy sources and storage, uh, something which isn't part one of the seven items of this conference, but one which I happen to believe we need to be paying a fair bit of attention. It could be truly disruptive and transformational. And again, we've already heard uh, from earlier speakers why that is so, if we didn't already know it ourselves. As I move up around the, around, uh, the, the diagram towards nanoscience, uh, we can see perhaps nanoscience offering real potential in new materials. Uh, so that would be smart materials that are adaptive in some way. They could be functional. They could be tough. Uh, they could give us the opportunity of adaptive camouflage. There are just so many possibilities. But nevertheless, nanoscience being not only limited to, but certainly a major contributor uh, to the area of uh, critical materials in structures and so forth. 
Moving on to autonomous systems, I think this is an area where I perceive there is the potential and likelihood in the not too distant future of a real game-changing kind of uh, innovation because it's something which uh, sits on the edge, as I shall explain later on, sits on the edge of carrying forward the kind of processing that we're very comfortable with, the kind of analysis that we're very comfortable with. But I suspect there's somebody out there, a graduate student, who is just perhaps at this moment coming to a realization that just maybe, just maybe you could do this another way. Maybe there's an issue of machine understanding that could have a real impact on things. Then moving on round, we come to um, uh, biotechnology, where linked to nanotechnology, uh, information and computing network systems and communications, that package creates together a range of exciting possibilities. And, of course, network science underpins everything, both at the individual level, networking the individual systems that a soldier will have on his or her equipment carrying with them, through to the complete uh, international uh, wide uh, area network that is part of knowing what's going on and maintaining full situational awareness and being able to achieve those critical decisions. Now, I'm going to focus uh, on a number of these topics. It's not possible to cover them all, so forgive me, please, if I just jump through a selected set. So, uh, next chart, please. Um, if we look at how we're addressing autonomy in the UK as a research topic, um, certainly in the context of land-based uh, systems, we've tended to develop the strategy around the familiar uh, OODA loop. And you see, if we move next, please, uh, if we look first of all at where we would uh, consider how autonomy might impact, uh, observe, sensors, sensing, uh, and also in picture compilation. I'm not going to read these things out. You can see well, uh, as well as I can. Moving through to orient, decide, and act. In other words, it's something, it's a, a technology that has potentially impact on the wide range and full range of activities critical to success in the land battle space. Next chart, please. But if I look at to how my folk have put together the roadmap uh, for achieving autonomy, it's quite interesting. Please, next chart. Keep going, please. And again. If you look at that, you'll see that there is a step taking forward uh, year by year how people perceive autonomy going. And it's a very respectable uh, incremental approach of how to do things. And I can't gainsay uh, very much. I might say that some of those periods are perhaps a little bit longer than I would have expected, but I can't particularly gainsay uh, what has been put down as a proposition based on the maturity uh, to various uh, technology readiness levels. But my sense is that something is going to happen, and what we need to do is to create the environment for that to happen. Next, please. Um, now, people of a certain age might just recognize uh, that picture, which is supposed to be Hal from 2001. 2001, do you remember that was nine, no, sorry, eight years ago or something like that? Well, we've moved beyond that, apparently. But nevertheless, the point being, uh, disruptive game-changing, I think that's potentially where we might see autonomy uh, having a major impact in, as I've said, issues associated with machine understanding, a new way of doing it. Okay, next chart, please. And this is just that real uh, same roadmap again, but expressed in a number of different ways. On the left-hand side, uh, you see um, in, in color form uh, a view of where the various states of the technology are today, um, moving over ultimately to the right-hand side where everything basically turns blue and hooray, we know all things about all things. But broadly speaking, this is the approach that we are taking in trying to drive an incremental research program, how we're trying to uh, yield what benefit we can from the, the, the technologies we understand it now, but we are also trying to create the environment, which I shall come on to in a moment, for how we might uh, stimulate more innovative and creative thinking to ha perhaps enable a degree of leapfrogging. Okay, next chart, please. Now, again, moving on to a few specific examples, and I'm staying with uh, autonomy here. Uh, this is in the context of being able to create vehicles with a degree of autonomy, uh, intelligence if you wish to call it that, uh, to be able to navigate around quite complex structures. Now in this case I'm assuming that they don't have GPS or whatever, that they're having to rely on their own internal capacity. And what you see here is essentially a route map starting up in the top right hand corner and the picture that it points to is what the scene looks like in that area. And this system, which we uh, call SLAM, standing for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, the, sl the SLAM system works its way around the urban environment, as you see by that map, eventually ending up in the bottom right-hand corner, which actually is the same place. But it's been confused because in the intervening period, somebody's parked a car there, and the scene looks to first order to be slightly different. Well, what we need to be able to do is to enhance our techniques and understanding so that it is possible to close that loop and for the systems to be able to have a better understanding of uh, how to uh, 
create that total picture of the environment. And we call this um, uh, basically visual homing, and it's uh, essentially a way of building up a picture and understanding uh, what actually that picture means. Okay, next chart, please. Uh, similar kind of thing, but this is more really to do with operating inside an enclosed area. Uh, essentially, what we have here is a system operating uh, using uh, structure from motion. You see the top picture really shows uh, a picture of a, of a scene inside of a room. The left and uh, lower pictures are of the system actually used to navigate itself around quite a complicated structure and produce this map you see in green on the right-hand side, bottom right-hand side, which is its estimate of uh, really what is the structure within that room. And this might be a very useful thing to be able to do uh, as a precursor uh, to sending in humans into what might be a highly complex and structured uh, area without them having to uh, learn as the same time as they deal with major threats, perhaps in uh, split seconds. Okay, next chart, please. If I now jump to talk a little bit about uh, some of the areas where we think incremental has been really, really successful, uh, the topic that jumps to my mind first is in the area of armor. We have a program called Passable, uh, which has already uh, been engaged in supporting 12 fairly major urgent operational requirements. And to say, it is a good example where uh, government working with industry uh, presented with some real problems have been able to very, very quickly uh, come up with solutions that have been fielded again in a very timely manner. So uh, I really just do want to underpin that there are certain areas where I really believe the incremental approach is exactly the right way to go. And uh, this is uh, one such area. Okay, next chart, please. You then come to something rather like this, this um, high-altitude, long-endurance UAV, uh, which has been called Zephyr. Uh, it's a program uh, that has been uh, driven by uh, our uh, key uh, contractor, Kinetic, in the UK, but has also engaged uh, strongly with uh, colleagues in the US. And, interesting enough, it's a, a very... Uh, fascinating, light, and superbly engineered um, uh, uh, UAV that currently holds um, the uh, world endurance record, recently um, uh, achieved this year. Uh, I believe something like about 82 and a half uh, hours at, uh, in excess of 60,000 feet. And uh, the system basically uh, demonstrated itself to be capable of going on really much longer than that. I think at the moment, interestingly enough, the, the limiting technology has been the power technology. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the system, essentially it has uh, solar cells on the upper surface of the wing, uh, which enables it to, of course, capture energy uh, during hours of, of, of sunlight. When it becomes dark, uh, it then draws on the battery power that it has been charging up during the daylight hours. It lowers in altitude, the sun comes up, and it begins the cycle again. But the limiting factor has been that ability uh, to have the right kind of energy storage uh, systems on board. So again, underpinning the importance of uh, that technology. But this this is something which could be, again, potentially quite game-changing. It has obvious applications in terms of ISTAR and communications, but it's quite interesting to conceive of a number of other systems that might be beneficial in a situation where you can sit at high altitude, uh, you can loiter almost indefinitely, you haven't quite got the expense and complication of uh, a satellite, but you are nevertheless able to endure for quite a wide period. And I think the potential of this is really only limited by our imagination. And so we call on our people uh, to think very carefully about imaginative ways in which that could be used. Next chart, please. Uh, say something now about immersive training. Um, and this is, again, I think, uh, a really quite fascinating uh, success story that uh, everyone will be familiar with because we all have experiences in our own countries about these things. Um, but looking at how we can uh, find ways of exploiting gaming technology where there's been vast investments for a variety of commercial uh, and um, uh, leisure, leisure purposes, how we can really couple into that, has two benefits, I suppose. One, yes, of course, we tie into that tremendous investment that's been made, but also it's something that our young people equate to. It's now part of their normal life. It's a tool set that becomes part of their normal, everyday way of working. And we need to be ever mindful of the fact that people do see things in quite different ways, and we need to find ways of capturing those parts of science and technology which have become part of normal life for the young people who are becoming the next and future generations of warfighters. Now, this is uh, something which, uh, again, probably, uh, as with uh, United States uh, experience, is something which we've been able to field uh, really quite effectively. And, in fact, it's operating out in theatre now, and we expect to be using these kind of technologies and so forth uh, even more so. Next chart, please. 
Uh, for this, I uh, owe thanks to uh, colleagues from Canada. Um, the point was made earlier on again today about the importance for training um, of a variety of synthetic and immersive techniques. Now, generally speaking, people have always said, well, this is a good idea because it's clearly a lot cheaper. It's far easier to uh, do training against a screen than it is to take up an expensive fast jet or an expensive vehicle or whatever. But it transpires, not only is it cheaper, actually, it can be better as well. If you look at the table here, uh, you see there's um, three columns talking about serials 0602, uh, 0701, and 0702, comparing the performance of uh, a variety of groups uh, undergoing their training. And the interesting thing is, looking at the bottom right-hand side, here we see a 100% success rate uh, based on the combination of real but critically uh, virtual-based uh, virtual battle space uh, simulation, which must be compared with even the case when uh, you have a partial uh, engagement with VBS, where you can achieve an 83% success. So the bottom, message, bottom line message here is uh, these kind of techniques not only are more cost effective in terms of they don't cost as much, but also they can produce a better result, something, again, we need to be aware of and learn. Next chart, please. Uh, Dr. Parmentola already mentioned this, and it would be impossible to uh, be able to stand up here and not uh, herald the success of the International Technology Alliance, uh, an activity which started between the UK uh, and the US Army back in 2006. It's gone on from strength to strength. Uh, there are four main, four main areas um, of uh, technology activity here, uh, shown in this chart. And uh, I, from the UK's perspective, we're really delighted with how this is going. I think it's a, a real example of how creative and innovative teams can work together, uh, not affected by the separation of a large chunk of water, and produce some really first-class science of real value, because the output of this now is actually being transitioned uh, to both the UK and the US Armed Forces. I think that's really excellent news. Next chart, please. And so on to the subject of uh, quantum signal processing. Uh, for the UK, much of our effort is focused on a consortium, a grouping um, of uh, academia and industry headed up by Oxford University. And it's focusing really on a couple of particular niche areas that we think the UK has uh, some real strengths in. Um, the key one, I suppose, is looking at how uh, we're able to um, uh, develop and transfer information through a number of modalities uh, different forms um, of uh, the quantum information so that you can conceive of an actual quantum machine, a quantum processor being able to transition data through the system. And uh, there's been uh, some very good uh, results coming from this group. In fact, there was a recent uh, paper published in Science uh, showing that uh, the team is actually, despite uh, not having perhaps as much money as they would like, in fact, I will say certainly not having as much money as they would like, still nevertheless producing some really superb results. Next chart, please. Okay, I said everything was underpinned by innovation, and I think this for the UK is uh, one of our major challenges. How to tap into the great source of science and technology expertise that's out there? How to find those people who are doing things of great relevance that we just don't know about? How do we inspire them and bring them forward to help us find solutions to the problems that we face. Well, uh, we have, uh, um, as it says in this chart, an innovation strategy underpinned by these five uh, key pillars. Sharing the vision, so people have to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, road mapping, yes, we need mechanisms for being able uh, to move things forward. We need to have a plan as to how to move things uh, through uh, to successful utilization. System engineering underpins everything that we need to do. We need to think about the total system uh, and we need to think about how we evolve the system to give us capability. Business models may seem to be an odd thing to put on an innovation uh, uh, chart, but it is of great importance. In the UK, we've been running a particular kind of business model that suited very well uh, the world of the Cold War. It is totally inappropriate to how we operate now, and therefore business models becomes an important part of uh, underpinning our innovation strategy. And at the centre, at the centre of this is the need for speed. I come back to it. Science and technology only buys your time. And we've got to find a way of being a lot quicker. And so you see in this chart a number of initiatives that we have underway, all of which are delivering benefits now in their respective boxes. But it's, again, something that we feel we have to keep driving harder and harder. We're looking for that way of finding and creating the environment for that really disruptive idea we will sp that we will be able to spot and move quickly uh, into the hands of the warfighter. And so my final chart, please. Uh, one particular 
uh, aspect of trying to uh, connect better to that science and technology that might be out there is to appeal to a wider audience. Now, one of the great things about this conference is that you have together in, under this one roof, uh, this one rather large roof, a whole bunch of uh, organizations, universities, uh, industry, industry with a background um, in, in defense, some perhaps with a lesser background in defense, but bringing you all together in this community is a great way of networking and people begin to learn from each other. We've not done anything like that in the UK, and so we've tried to find a number of ways in which we can appeal uh, to that wider community. And one of the ways in which we did this was uh, through a grand challenge uh, which took place, uh, the actual uh, competition, so to speak, took place in August of this year, a very wet, soggy August, which we get quite a lot of in the UK, I'm afraid to say. For those of you who will have visited, you'll know this can be the case. Uh, we were delighted that uh, Dr. Killian could come along and uh, participate and uh, uh, see how uh, things went, and that was a, a great pleasure for us for him to be there. But it was an opportunity to, as I've said, appeal to a wider community in the science and technology community to come forward with ideas and to become engaged in bringing their innovation uh, to the defense area. And uh, from that perspective, we found it was a great success. So, uh, final chart, please. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed uh, for your patience. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. I hope you found my quick journey through some of the aspects of that technology uh, landscape of, of some interest and some value. And I very much look forward to uh, us continuing to work with you uh, for many more years into the future because we've got a tough job to do. Thank you very much indeed.